Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week, we continue our exploration into industrial AI. What's that, you ask? Well, in my forthcoming paper on the topic, I define industrial AI as any application of AI relating to the physical operations or systems of an enterprise. I go on to note that the focus of industrial AI is on helping enterprises monitor, optimize, or control the behavior of these operations and systems to improve their efficiency and performance. When people hear the phrase industrial, they quickly jump to manufacturing, but it's more than that. Industrial AI includes manufacturing applications like robotics and using computer vision for quality control, but also applications like supply chain optimization and risk management, warehouse automation, the monitoring and operation of building HVAC systems, and much more. For more information about industrial AI or the report, visit twimmelaicom slash industrial AI. This week, our guest is Peter Rabiel. Assistant Professor at UC Berkeley, Research Scientist at OpenAI, and Co-Founder of Gradescope. Peter has an extensive background in AI research, going way back to his days as Andrew Ng's first PhD student at Stanford. His work today is focused on deep learning for robotics. During this conversation, Peter and I really dig into reinforcement learning, which is a technique for allowing robots or other AIs to learn through their own trial and error. Before we jump in, a quick nerd alert. This conversation explores cutting-edge research with one of the leading researchers in the field, and as a result, it gets pretty technical at times. I try to up-level it when I can keep up myself, so hang in there. I promise that you'll learn a ton if you keep with it. I could also use your feedback here. Do you want more or fewer of these kinds of conversations? Let me know in the comments, along with any feedback, comments, or questions you have about this episode. Before we jump in, a word about our sponsor. I introduced Bonsai last week, and once again, I'd like to thank the team over there for sponsoring this podcast series, as well as my forthcoming industrial AI research. Bonsai offers an AI platform that empowers enterprises to build and deploy intelligent systems. If you're trying to build AI-powered applications focused on optimizing and controlling the systems in your enterprise, you should take a look at what they're up to. They've got a unique approach to building AI models that let you use high-level code to model real-world concepts in your application, automatically generate, train, and evaluate low-level models for your project using reinforcement learning and other technologies, and then easily integrate those models into your applications and systems using APIs. You should check them out at bonds.ai, B-O-N-S dot A-I, and definitely let them know you appreciate their support of the podcast. And now... On to the show. All right. Hello, everyone. I have got Peter Abiel on the line. Peter is an associate professor at UC Berkeley, a research scientist at OpenAI, and a co founder at Gradescope. Peter, how are you? Doing pretty well. How about you, Sam? I'm doing very well and excited to jump into this conversation. In addition to uh, all of those positions you hold, you are also, you know, at the cutting edge of a very interesting field in machine learning called deep reinforcement learning. And I'm really looking forward to learning a bunch about that uh, talking with you today. Uh, Why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to where you are now in your area of research? Sure, yeah. If I go pretty far back, actually, as a high schooler, my excitement was mostly about physics and and math. And from there, engineering was a natural uh, next pick. Um, And when I was wrapping up my bachelor's in engineering, I just found so many topics so exciting and uh, it was hard to choose. But ultimately, it seemed artificial intelligence was the area that could drive almost all other areas. Mm. That is, by making progress in AI, it might be possible to help, you know, how how to do many, many other things. And so that's kind of what drove me into AI and then got me started in my master's and then PhD on uh, artificial intelligence with uh, Andrew at Stanford. And then from there... I uh, became professor at Berkeley and research scientist at OpenAI. Well, working with Andrew, that's an impressive credential. He's done a lot of amazing things in the field. 
I couldn't agree more. I was very fortunate that I was actually his first PhD student, so I saw him start from ground zero, which was uh, oh was wow, amazing. wow. Uh, and so, what is what are you focused on today? So, a lot of what drives my my work is trying to get robots out in the real world, meaning beyond repetitive tasks as you would see in current robot deployments. And so, what I think is key to get robots out in the, in the real world and doing more flexible things is to give them more intelligence and key to that will be for them to be able to learn rather than us having to program them for every possible scenario they mm. could encounter. And so reinforcement learning obviously comes up in that. Is that just one of a number of techniques that you're looking into uh, to make robots smarter or you know, what's kind of the landscape of things that you're pursuing there? Right. So there's, there's many ways to, to learn. If you look at the kind of machine learning landscape, there is supervised learning, which is recognizing a pattern between inputs and outputs. There is unsupervised learning, which is trying to make sense of just data that doesn't have any labels. And there is reinforcement learning, which looks at um, trying to optimize reward, which is a really good fit for robotics. So let's say you have a robot and maybe you want it to clean your home. Um, then you can define a reward function that says, the cleaner my home, the higher the reward. And then a reinforced learning algorithm deployed on a robot would try to optimize that reward and as a consequence, optimize the cleanliness of your home if it's successful. Mm. So we've been hearing a lot about uh, deep reinforcement learning of late, uh, but is reinforcement learning as a whole, is it is it new or has it been in use for a while? And how was it done prior to deep learning? Yeah, so reinforcement learning has been around for a long time. Ever since people started thinking about artificial intelligence, they were thinking about things like reinforcement learning. Because when you think about AI, you think about some kind of intelligent system, supposedly required to make a decision. And then after making that decision, there will be consequences. And then it will need to deal with the consequence of that action. And this will repeat over and mm -hmm. over and over. And that is exactly the reinforcement learning setting where some systems, some AI systems are supposed to make decisions that have impact over time and then adjust over time. Right. And so it's been around for a very long time. Um, actually, even before deep reinforcement, there were quite a few interesting success stories. For example, Andrew Ng's autonomous helicopter, I was part of the group working on that, um, but the helicopter at Stanford was largely driven by uh, reinforcement okay. learning. And this was just regular reinforcement learning, no deep neural nets behind it. Russ Tedrick, professor at MIT now, but during his PhD at MIT also, he build a biped walker that learned to walk with regular reinforcement learning, no deep networks involved. Um, but what characterized those early successes is that it required a combination of a lot of domain expertise with expertise in reinforcement learning. So you would carefully think about how does a helicopter work? What are the relevant aspects of uh, controlling a helicopter? Talk to experts in helicopter piloting, what they pay attention to, what they think about. And then you would condense that into some representation you define to decide what it means to be a good helicopter control policy. You'd say, well, helicopter control policy would look at these and these and these aspects of helicopter uh, state and then make a decision based on that. Mm -hmm. And you'd leave a few free parameters in there. For example, for the helicopter control case, there were 12 parameters that were not determined. They were just real numbers that were hard to come up with by hand, but then the reinforced learning algorithm would find those 12 parameters better than a person could find them by hand. And that would lead to extremely reliable helicopter flight. Mm -hmm. But the big difference now with uh, deep reinforcement learning is that it largely takes away the need for domain expertise. So if you look at the results on Atari, Go, or the results in robotics that we, for example, got at Berkeley with learning assembly, you look at those and what goes into the thing that's that's learning is raw sensory percept. So it'll get raw pixels from the Atari game. It'll get just the raw board configuration, not some new encoding of strengths or weaknesses about the board configuration, just the raw configuration. Mm -hmm. For learning assembly, it'll get raw pixels of what the robot is seeing, and we'll need to make decisions based on that. And so now it's the deep network that somehow makes sense of this raw sensory information and turns it then into, after a, a long computation, into meaningful control commands, which is a very different setup from these previous successes where you would have had to analyze ahead of time, what is it that we need to pay attention to? How can we extract that 
with a separate piece of code that then is fed into the reinforcement learner. Mm -hmm. Are we limited by our ability to incorporate that domain expertise into the deep neural networks? And the, uh, the background for that question is I'm just imagining that if we were able to incorporate that domain expertise in, the models would be even smarter and more accurate. So it's a very interesting question. How can you kind of get the best of both worlds? Exactly, exactly. Question, I think it's like, how do you get both the domain expertise and um, the flexibility of learning things from raw sensory information. Like, for example, I had a conversation with uh, Stefano Ehrman, who you may know over at Stanford. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about was some of his work on incorporating, uh, for example, physics models into uh, machine learning models and how they were able to um, you know, dramatically increase the accuracy of a uh, projectile trajectory model by telling it a little bit about, you know, the parabolic trajectory that things take when they're moving through free space via physics. And it strikes me that if we could, you know, again, get the best of both worlds, that would help us here. Absolutely. So that, that is a perfect example. So let me maybe expand the scope of this a little bit. So if, if you look at prior knowledge, it can come in in many different formats. So one, one thing is, for example, you might know that physics is involved and that the laws of physics could help you in making decisions. It might also be that you know certain existing algorithms could be relevant. Maybe you know that a common filter, which was actually used to you know, track the first rocket that, that went to the moon, mm -hmm. um, that that idea is going to be relevant because you want to track maybe the position of your self-driving car. Or maybe you know that a planning computation, a computation that doesn't just reactively look at the current sensor inputs and, and spits out an action, but actually thinks ahead, simulates what would happen if you were to take a certain sequence of actions, and then based on that, makes a decision. And so there's many of those ideas out there that um, we know can play a role in decision making. And... If a deep neural net is supposed to figure it out all from scratch, the data needs might be prohibitive to get to a practical application anytime soon. Right. And so what you can do there, which is actually really interesting, which maybe transcends deep networks a little bit, which is that actually the automatic differentiation frameworks, such as TensorFlow, Theano, PyTorch, and so forth, these frameworks actually can differentiate to anything. They're not specific to neural nets. And so what you can do is you can set up something more complex than a neural net, um, uh, more generalized, a computation graph. What you can do with that is you can essentially set up a computation graph that encodes uh, the algorithm or the prior knowledge that you have. So, for example, if you thought you wanted to use a Kalman filter, you could set up the equations of the Kalman filter inside these frameworks. Now, typically what would happen is you, you still need to deal with raw pixels, so you would take your raw pixels, feed them through a deep network that feeds into these common filter equations that then leads to some uh, output. And so what you get then if you train this is that you're training this big computation graph that has the flexibility of a neural net, namely the ability to adapt to how you should process raw sensory information, but then also the advantage of knowing that a certain computation will matter and have it built into it. And you can optimize this all in, in one optimization. You don't need to separately find a neural net that you then plug into a common filter. The same is true for the physics equations that you were referring to that could be, for example, inside of a planner. So you could have your neural net processing raw sensor information, feed that into another computation that has a planner in it, and the planner can rely on physics equations, and you don't fully wire up the details of how it's going to rely on that. You let it figure that out, but it's a component that sits there ready for it to use such that it can be more effective at learning from whatever data it's getting, what the right thing is to do. Hmm. It sounds like there, there's definitely a lot in there to unpack, but it sounds like in a nutshell, what you're saying is that these, you know, our prior knowledge, whether it's a form of, in the form of governing equations or models or subject matter expertise or what have you, you can almost think of them as like, features that you're eventually going to be using as inputs to your neural networks. And in fact, you know, these features, we've got a tremendous amount of depth that we can express through, you know, matrix math and differential equations. 
you know, they can go through the same infrastructure that we're using to train our reinforcement learning models vis-a-vis TensorFlow and the like. Absolutely correct. And, and w- one thing that this also reminds me of is um, when you think about all these equations, they've been developed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, mathematics has been developed over time. If you think of, you know, there's a lot of benefits to, to reinforcement learning in and of itself. And, and it's, it's really powerful to be able to learn from scratch. Um, but the way humans often learn is actually by imitation. Mm-hmm. which is just as important an area of uh, deep learning for for action, for systems that can take action. Because mm-hmm. um, if you think about it, I mean, imagine, you know, our intelligence now, our reinforcement learning capabilities now as humans are probably not that different from what our reinforcement learning capabilities were 100,000 years ago or even 200,000 years ago. But we live a very different life. And the reason we live a very different life is because we don't all start from scratch. Right. We actually build upon what previous generations have developed, have built, and then we learn from that much more effectively than if we had to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of um, applications of reinforcement learning actually will, will rely on a combination of imitation learning and reinforcement learning. So a typical setting would be something where you say, well, I want my robot maybe to, I don't know, I want to maybe uh, stack some dishes. And then a natural thing to do would be to, instead of starting from scratch with reinforcement learning, which, of course, in some sense is beautiful intellectually, but at the same time is very ineffective given that you know what stacking dishes looks like, uh, the more natural thing to do would be to show how to stack a few dishes Mm -hmm. and have the system watch you do that and then use that as a guide to then learn its own motor skills that will allow it to match up with what you just did. That actually poses a a lot of challenges. In the simplest version, you would actually just move the robot's arms around and make the robot experience everything. But that is not how you would want to do it in the long run. Long run, you want to just do it yourself, have the robot watch you and understand what is the essence, namely the objects that are being moved around and what is not essence, namely that it's your hands versus robot hands or that maybe you are moving your head in certain ways that are irrelevant to the task because you just might be looking because somebody comes by and checking out what they're doing. Right. And so a robot understanding from watching a human, what is the essence and distilling that into then understanding how to do something themselves in their own body, which is different from the human's body. Um, there's a lot of interesting challenges that actually will go a long way in terms of seeding the robot's capabilities to then bring in reinforcement learning to really get fine-tuned skills. Hmm. When we're doing imitation learning, what what's the underlying mechanism or what are some of the underlying mechanisms that we're using to kind of capture what the, you know, what we're training on, that what we're imitating? Is it like we're constraining the the state space of the ultimate solution and so like we don't have to train a bunch of things or are we like building representations of what the robot's seeing or some combination of all that plus other stuff? Yeah, so there have been a, quite a few interesting things happening over the past year that I think uh, are, are changing what's possible with, with imitation learning. So one, one piece of work that happened to come out of OpenAI about a half year ago was uh, third-person imitation learning. And so what that considers is it, it considers the specific problem of how to learn when you are watching from a third-person point of view what it is that you should do, but then later you should do it yourself, in which case it'll look very different because it's now you with your own hands from your own viewpoint, Mm -hmm. uh, first person viewpoint. And so some of the ideas we we put at play there were actually quite related to uh, some work Stefano Ehrman did at Stanford, who who you just mentioned, on imitation learning uh, through generative adversarial networks. And so the idea there was to say, in the original paper uh, from Stefano's group, the, uh, this was Jonathan Ho, Stefano's student, they looked at how can we generate a behavior that a adversarial network cannot distinguish from the demonstration behavior. Because if mm, an mm-hmm. adversarial neural net cannot distinguish the robot's behavior right. from the demonstrations, then that means that the robot might have captured what matters about those demonstrations. Now, the tricky part is... What does behavior mean here? Is it, is it the movements or the outcomes? So that, those are things that the algorithm designer has a little bit of an open-ended choice there. Do, do you just let it look at the outcome? Do you let it look at the entire trajectory? Most of mm-hmm. the work, let again, look at the entire trajectory and based on that, make a decision okay. of whether 
this is the same or not the same as, as the expert. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you do first person demonstrations where you're inside the robot, this will work. But now if you have a third person view on the demonstration, this will never work. This is always very easy to distinguish the demonstration from the robot's execution because, well, the demonstration is going to be this, this human doing something and then the robot's going to do it. And it's obvious that right. there is a human or a robot. And, and so you can't directly apply this in a third person setting. And when you say Especially, inside the robot, you mean controlling the robot remotely using the, some controller. Uh, yeah, we're using some controllers, but then the robot experiences it themselves as if they're doing it. Right. right? And so what, what you need then is something extra, something that says, I want the GAN not to be able to distinguish between the two, but what it's looking at, the GAN should not have access to certain pieces of information. Mm. It should not have access to essentially what identifies the human versus robot, because then it's obvious and it's not actually paying attention to the essence of what you care about. Right. So in the third person imitation work, we brought, we brought in another actually GAN related idea, uh, domain confusion. And what you do there is you, you process information through your neural net. And then at some layer in the neural net, you decide that it should not be possible to distinguish between two things. In this case, between whether it was a robot or a human doing it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not allowed to distinguish in that layer, that means that layer, the features that live in that layer, are not allowed to can contain information anymore about human versus robot, but only about other things like the objects in the scene, which are shared between the demonstration and, and the robot. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a way to make sure that that information is removed and then you start paying attention to the essence when you're, you're trying to imitate. Hmm. It actually has other applications too. For example, um, I believe it's Richard Semmel's group at the University of Toronto has looked at this in terms of understanding uh, things like um, fairness in, in machine learning. So you can imagine that you, know, you, you don't want to make a decision based on certain features. Maybe you don't want to make a decision with your machine learning system based on race. Mm -hmm. But if you just remove race from your feature set, that's not enough because the zip code might correlate with race right, or yet right. something else might correlate with race. And so as your neural net processes things, you could decide that at some layer... The information should not be extractable anymore, what the race was of the person being processed. And then at that point, you know that the decision is being made by your machine learning system while not depending on the feature that you didn't want to depend on, not just not directly depending on it, but also implicitly not depending on it through, you know, how it could have figured it out from other features. So that, that's the domain confusion idea um, and I, in, in another application domain. Now, how are we identifying the layers that are encoding this feature that we don't want to be able to use? So that's a good question and often requires a little bit of trial and error. But essentially, you, you take a deep network and somewhere in the middle of that network, you, you pick a layer and you decide this layer is the, the one I'm going to use. And at this point, it's not allowed to be um, distinguishable anymore, let's say, between human and robot or, you know, can't recover race or yet, you know, sometimes right. people would do it between simulated environment and real world environment and so forth. And what does it mean to not allow the network to use that layer? Does that mean you're not propagating, you know, things from that layer forward or you're not, you're changing weights or? So what that means is that at that layer, there is your network that continues that, that will try to make a decision of maybe what action to take or whether it's expert versus non-expert and so forth. But then you branch off a second head of the neural network. It'll get a second head, and mm -hmm. it could be a pretty deep head that can do a lot of computation. And that second head is on its output classifies, let's say, between robot and person. Mm -hmm. And then instead of maximizing the accuracy of that head, you minimize the accuracy. You make it maximally confused. Mm. So you're basically training that, your network to forget about or obfuscate that information in that network, in that layer, rather. Exactly. So mm -hmm. you want it to be that that network can do well, and the head is trying to be accurate, but the layers before the split need to do something to ensure that that head cannot be accurate. And so the early set of layers needs to lose the information such that that head cannot achieve what it's trying to do. That's incredible. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Uh, so we've we've got we've gotten pretty deep here. I, I want to maybe take a step back to kind of RL, deep uh, reinforcement learning, and 
maybe address, I think when most folks come into contact with reinforcement learning, it's probably in the context of games like Atari video games and, you know, other games that people are training RL models to try to play. Well, first, I, I, I'm wondering if you can speak to, you know, what's the significance of games to RL? Why are they so popular as training vehicles? And then um, maybe we can dig into some of the you know, techniques that folks are using vis-a-vis you know, -vis policy gradients and cue learning and what those mean and, and how they're applied. Sure. So there are a few things that make games very interesting as a research environment. So one aspect is that games are designed by humans for other humans. And so they're designed with some kind of intelligence in mind. And so it's very interesting to see if we can build an artificial intelligence that can also play those games. Now, related to that, they're designed by humans for other humans, but they were designed not with artificial intelligence in mind. So it's, it's not something where you get to design a game once you have your algorithm in mind. The games already exist, mm -hmm. and we need to see if our algorithms can tackle these existing games. There, I will say there are also a few, a few downsides to games. So, so one of the big upside is, of course, that simulation is easier than real-world experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, far safer, uh, you can paralyze more easily, and you can often like, have more self-contained environments to make it easier to, to run large-scale experiments relative to the size of the environment. And so there's a lot of benefits to simulation, including also simulation of other things, uh, such as simulated robots. Where games can get a little tricky is that it's, it's not always obvious if you start looking at more advanced things like transfer. If you learn in one game, can you learn more quickly in another game? It's not always obvious that whether this should be possible or not. Whereas if you look at things like, for example, simulated or real robotic manipulation, it's more natural to expect that if you learn to pick up one object, it should help you learn to pick up another object. Mm, mm -hmm. And if your algorithm is not able to get that kind of transfer, it's probably your algorithm that's at fault, or maybe it didn't see enough data yet. Whereas if you learn to play, let's say, Pong, and then you're supposed to learn Montezuma's Revenge, it's not immediately obvious that there should be any transfer between the two games. Mm -hmm. And so one of, one of the big questions, I think, when you think about RL is, are, are you learning for mastery or are you learning for generalization? Hmm. And so mastery is where you stay within one environment, one game. You say, I want to master Montezuma's Revenge, which, by the way, no system has done yet. It's one of the harder Atari games uh, in, in that suite that, that's uh, researched a lot. Okay. Um, but it's still a different question. Can you master one game versus can you learn something that then can be helping you in the future to learn something else more quickly? Right. And so that's, that's where games can get a little trickier unless you're very careful about maybe which set of games you, you choose. And at the risk of kind of going, kind of arguing down into another detail, uh, 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 with regards to transfer learning, is there any work looking at transfer learning? Is transfer learning only done kind of at the level of an entire deep network or can you transfer learn specific layers or, you know, architectural subsets of a, a network? That's a good question. I, th I think transfer learning is still very much an open problem to, to, to claim anybody's found like a, a full solution to it. But yeah. There's definitely been some progress and people have done very interesting things. So for example, one type of transfer that's been very successful is training on ImageNet mm -hmm. and then fine tuning on a new data set. So this would be for computer vision. Yeah. You want to do a good computer vision on a new task where you have a small amount of data. You first train on ImageNet, which is a, a data set with uh, many, many labeled images, a thousand categories. And it turns out if you train to be good at recognizing those thousand categories, the later layers of this deep network contain features that are quite good. And in fact, the entire network contains information that's quite good to then reuse to train on another data set, still a vision data set, of course, but one that might not have as many labels and might have completely different categories. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's one example. The idea being that the training on ImageNet teaches your network, you know, things like edges and textures and things like that that are transferable to other vision-related tasks. Exactly. And so I think some of the most exciting work in terms of, of transfer has actually been inspired by those, those results. Mm -hmm. And it falls under the category of uh, few shot learning. And the idea there is that at training time, you might see a lot of data that you can do all kinds of things with. 
But then at test time, you'll get to see new data that has different categories, but, and you're supposed to learn very quickly what to do for those new categories. For example, a standard thing could be, maybe you have ImageNet, which has 1,000 categories. At training time, you only get to train on 800 categories. At test time, the new categories get presented to you, and you need to adapt very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that's the few shot learning setup. People do this for other data sets like Omniglot, which is a handwritten character data set. And so some of the ideas there essentially, um, one example that we worked on recently, this was uh, led by uh, Chelsea Finn, a PhD student at uh, Berkeley, was to see if it's possible to also apply this to reinforcement learning. So people had had some success in, in supervised learning, but can you in reinforcement learning train in training environments, but then somehow reuse what you learn there in new test environments that are related. So maybe you learn to control a ant simulated robot to do uh, certain things, like maybe running at certain speeds, but then at test time it needs to mm -hmm. run at a very different speed. And the question is how quickly can it learn to run at that different speed? Can it do it with a very small number of policy gradient updates? And indeed the experiments found that it is possible with a very small number of updates to adjust to a new task at test time. Compared to typical RL, if you were to learn from scratch, would need a very large uh, number of iterations. Which brings us back to uh, policy gradients and queue learning. Yes, absolutely. So let's start with queue learning. So what's the idea behind queue learning? What's a queue value? A queue value is the queue value of a current state and current action is how much reward you expect to get when you start in that current state, state, take that action, and from then onwards, act optimally. Okay? So if you have the Q values, it's very easy to decide what to do. You look at the Q values in your current state, and you just choose the action that maximizes the Q value in that current state, and that's the best action to take. Now, of course, the mm -hmm. tricky part is how do you find your Q values? You need, you need to somehow know what they are for, for every state that might be in the world. And so there's a lot of states. And so building just a table that tells you whatever Q value is, is not practical unless your, your environment is really, <laughs> really tiny and not of practical interest. So for realistic environments or even just for larger, not that realistic environments, like just some simple uh, video games, typically the Q values are represented by a deep neural net these days. And so the input to the neural net would be, let's say, pixel values, what's currently on the screen, and output would be for each action that you can take, the Q value of that action for the current screen configuration. And so for, for the initial Atari results from DeepMind, they trained a Q network. And from its own Tron error, this network was trained to take on the right values or good enough values such that if you use the trained Q network um, to choose your actions, you actually perform quite well in the game. The intuition on how you train this Q network is as follows. You say, okay, what does it mean to be a Q value? It's the value of current state in action. Okay, that is actually equal to the reward you're going to get in the first transition that you encounter from current time to next time, plus the Q value at the next state that you land in. Because how well you do from current state is how well you do in the first step, plus then how well you do in all future steps. And so that's, that then mm -hmm. now gives you actually a self-consistent set of equations that says Q value equals reward plus Q value at next state. And so mm -hmm. what Q learning algorithms do is they solve this self-consistent set of equations. And the way to solve it is by collecting a lot of data from running trials in, in the environment and on the states and actions that are experienced, trying to enforce the self-consistency of that set of equations. And mm -hmm. once you've enforced the self-consistency, you end up with, if, if it's fully enforced, you end up with the correct Q values and that'll prescribe your actions and also tell you how good it is to be in a certain state and take a certain action. In practice, they won't be fully made self-consistent. It's a very large set of equations, and it's not easy to make that self-consistency true. But stochastic gradient updates will get you closer to self-consistency. And as you get closer, acting based on those Q values will, will typically uh, lead to, to pretty good behavior. And so are policy gradients a, uh, an enhancement of that basic technique, or is it a different technique altogether? So it's very interesting. So policy gradients are, are a different family of techniques, but I'll get back to how they might actually be quite similar once I've explained it, because actually there is some recent work showing that there might be stronger connections than people might have initially thought. Okay. But so what policy gradients do in some sense is 
much simpler to explain. What's a policy? A policy is, in these days, it, it's a function. Uh, and these days, it's typically a deep neural net. So it's a deep neural net that takes in, let's say, current pixels and outputs the action mm -hmm. that you're going to take. Or a distribution over actions is what often is used. So input, current situation, output, distribution over actions. So, so once you have a policy, you can follow that policy by sampling from that distribution over actions, and then you're executing the policy. Of course, most policies are not good policies, so you need to do some work to find a good policy. And so a policy gradient approach is a very, used a very simple idea. Um, let's say you have a current policy, you execute a few times, you see what happens, you see how much reward you got, and now what you can do is you can perturb your policy. You can say, let me use a slightly different policy and execute again and see what happens. Then you can compare how well did my original policy do, how well did my new policy do, in terms of how much reward they collected. And whichever is the better one, you retain and you repeat. That would be a simple way to do it. Um, and so that way you're gradually improving your policy as you iterate in your algorithm. And so you said a policy is, a, is for all intents and purposes, a deep neural network. When we perturb the policy, are we changing the weights? Are we randomly changing the weights? Like what does that mean specifically? So there's different ways. That's a really good question. Different strategies to do policy perturbation. So one way you can perturb the policy is by just randomly perturbing the weights in the neural net. Another mm -hmm. way you can get variation to get gradient signal from is by ensuring that your distribution over that you have a distribution over actions, so a non-deterministic policy. And then what happens is you sample your actions from that distribution. And so every rollout will lead to different behavior. And it turns out that you can compute policy gradients from that too using something called the likelihood ratio policy gradient. And that effectively pieces apart and then makes actions that led to better reward more likely and actions that led do less reward, less likely, and does an update to your policy uh, that way. You can also do something like finite differences where you go per coordinate. Of course, in high dimensions, that's a little tricky. You could go per coordinate, increase the value of that coordinate. Coordinate here is a, a single weight in your neural net. For each, thing, each weight in your neural net, you can increase the weight, decrease it, and just use like a high school type derivative calculation uh, with finite difference where you say, I increase the x value, decrease the x value. Now I look at f of x plus minus f of x minus divided by the size of the perturbation, and that gives me my derivative. Um, so that, 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 that's probably a baseline that you could check, but that would be somewhat sample inefficient if you had a high dimensional uh, uh, policy. Okay, so the summary on Q learning and policy gradients is Q learning, you've got a neural network that's representing uh, essentially a sequence of consistent equations and you solve that you solve for your model by enforcing that consistency and coming up with a, a set of weights that um, kind of maximizes the the score if you will and maximize the, uh, the consistency maximize the consistency okay okay and then with policy gradients you've got this policy that is well, explain for me actually the relationship between the policy neural network and the broader neural network. Is one a subset of the other or are they just two totally different things? So in policy gradients, the policy network is the only network that you might use and it just represents the policy directly. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that some recent work, both from DeepMind and from OpenAI, here, John Schulman was, was the lead author here at OpenAI, show that there's a very close connection between policy gradients and Q-learning as Q-learning is typically used. So if you look at how Q-learning is typically used in practice, look at the details, because there's, there's various incarnations you can have of Q-learning, but this typical way of using it in practice is that you collect data based on what your current Q function prescribes. Once you do that, it becomes a lot closer to a policy gradient method, because the policy gradient method also says, I have a current policy, I collect data, and I improve the policy based on that. If you have a Q function, a current Q function, which of course doesn't satisfy the self-consistency equations yet, but you collect data based on that current Q function and then try to get the self-consistency to be more satisfied, it turns out that that update is extremely similar and, and under some additional specific assumptions that are quite practical and people often have algorithms that match those, the two become unified. And Q learning and policy gradients end up using the same update equations as each other, which is very intriguing. Um, it actually explains, hmm. in many ways, some of the mystique that, that has been behind Q-learning in the sense that 
if you look at uh, Q-learning in this self-consistency set of equations, it turns out that what it ends up being found doesn't really fully satisfy the self-consistency. And also the values that you find running Q-learning, which are supposed to be how much reward you'll get going forward from that state and action, um, the values are often way, way off. They're, they're not precise at all. And nevertheless, mm -hmm. somehow this Q-learning algorithm leads to a good policy. And so this connection between the two that uh, John Schulman uh, figured out uh, essentially shows why it might be that Q-learning leads to good policies, namely that it's secretly running something like a policy gradient algorithm underneath or something very close to it. Uh, is the idea then when you talked about collecting additional data, is it that in both Q learning and policy gradients, you're training some agent to kind of navigate an environment and the agent in either case tends to perform behaviors in a rough neighborhood of what it has previously seen and done. And, you know, and that's kind of the cause of the one approximating the other. That's exactly right. The, 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 the space is so big that the learning tends to focus on where you currently would be going with what you have learned so far. And right. once right. you do that in Q-learning, because it's natural to restrict attention to that, because why, why try to learn about everything? There's so much. You might be busy for too long. Mm -hmm. Once you mostly pay attention to what your current Q function prescribes, you start being extremely similar to a policy gradient method. You've mentioned pixels a few times in your descriptions. Is reinforcement learning only applied to applications that are that have some vision component? So reinforcement learning can take in any type of sensory input. So raw sensory information could be pixels, but it could be something else. So in robotics, we also take in joint angles and joint velocities because, well, the motors that are part of the robot know those values and they're very informative about what situation the robot is currently in. Um, so that's mm -hmm. being fed in too. Um, looking ahead, things that are very interesting to me are uh, things like tactile sensing. If you have a robot hand, if you can have tactile sensing on that robot hand, that should amplify what this robot hand is capable of doing. But now, how mm -hmm. do you process that information? How do you turn this raw sensor tactile information into an understanding of how you're holding the object, what are some object properties of the object that you're holding and so forth. Those are, those are challenging problems, mm -hmm. um, but also the kind of problems that I, I suspect deep learning could help solve because it, it is the right. same flavor of problem as the image processing type problems. You have high dimensional sensor information. The information is intrinsically in there, but it just somehow needs to be teased apart from these raw sensor inputs. And so it should be learnable if we uh, set up the data collection for that, if we have some supervision or if there's some reward related to, you know, if you had a reward such that to be successful on that reward, tactile would matter, then presumably that robot hand would learn how to process tactile information because that would be the way to, to maximize reward. Hmm. So we've talked about, uh, we've talked about games, we've talked about robots. You know, focusing in on the industrial applications of reinforcement learning in and around robots and other other use cases that would uh, appear within an enterprise context. What use cases have we seen success with, and where are we kind of getting close? Okay, that that's a great question. That uh, actually, first, I think a lot of reinforcement learning right now is happening in still research environments. So if you look at a lot of the big success stories of reinforcement learning, and that are very well known, learning to play Atari games, learning to play Go, um, which by the way is a combination of imitation and reinforcement learning in that case. Um, learning simulated mm -hmm. locomotion skills, that was some of the work John Schulman and Sergey Levin did at, at, uh, at Berkeley, or learning robot motor control, but still for, for very simple tasks, this was uh, Sergey Levin and Chelsea Finn at Berkeley, how, how to assemble, let's say, toys all of those are, are still a little removed from what you would think of as, as real-world uh, deployment. I think there are a few reasons for that. I think one reason is that these algorithms are only recently ha have become like really something that people are able to get to work. Five years ago, people didn't think those things are possible. But now they're starting to work. 
And it takes some time to transition that into applications, especially since for mm -hmm. now, it still requires a little bit of, well, I would say a substantial amount of reinforcement learning expertise to make sure these things work out. And so the number of people who can put this to use is, is still a little limited. And a lot of those people are actually excited about expanding the research frontier rather than necessarily putting it into applications. So there's maybe a slight mm -hmm. shortage of reinforcement learning experts that are taking their expertise then and, and try to deploy them in the real world because the real world has many domains where it could be applied. Um, anything where you make decisions over time, reinforcement learning is going to matter. This could be for your HVAC system. This could be for, let's say, uh, service, servicing demand in queues where maybe you're, you're uh, providing support. Longer run, once language understanding is better, this could be part of dialogue because the goal in dialogue is not just to spit out a statistically reasonable sentence in reply to the previous one. The goal in dialogue tends to be figuring out what the other person wants to achieve and helping them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And so in that scenario, there is a reinforced learning problem in terms of maximizing reward is maximizing happiness of the other side in terms of what they get out of this conversation and so forth. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're actually doing in late August is this is me together with a few other people. So also Vlad and me from, from DeepMind, Andre Karpathy from OpenAI, Sergey Levin from Berkeley, Chelsea Finn from Berkeley, and then John Schulman, Rocky Dwan, and Peter Chen uh, from OpenAI is organizing a deep reinforcement learning bootcamp in late August. Mm. The, the, the incentive here is that it seems reinforcement learning is getting ready to be deployed in various application domains in industry, but it'll require more experts. And so to educate experts to then start, you know, they, they will see the applications. Once they're experts, they'll see the applications and tr latch onto them and start deploying things. And so the hope is to kind of accelerate that a little bit by having a weekend, a very intense weekend with lectures, but at least about 50% uh, lab sessions where people really, you know, get things working um, in all the environments we talked about, simulated robots, video games, and so forth, get the essence down, but then with the hope that they can take it back to their companies or to their research efforts, because it's also useful for, for researchers um, to be more productive and, and get things done uh, with reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds great. Um, I will get the URL to that from you and we'll make sure to include it in the show notes. It sounds like the summary is that the technology is ready, but there's still a shortage of expertise to help folks build out these applications and, you know, start so that we can start to see, um, you know, a proliferation of success stories out in uh, the commercial world. Yeah, I might, I, I might, I might say the technology is at the cusp of, of being ready. I wouldn't say it's like very mature. It's, it's like, it's, it's getting there and the first application should become possible in the near future, but technology should also still be improved a lot over the next few years. And in your experience, is reinforcement learning often a, an alternative to some other technique that, you know, might work or uh, is reinforcement learning kind of the only way to solve the problems that reinforcement learning is good at? And, you know, is there a general way to characterize like the benefits or advantages of RL relative to, you know, some alternative approaches? So the typical starting point when you need to make decisions over time, like in reinforcement learning would be uh, imitation learning because imitation learning is simpler. It's, it's, it's like supervised learning. You would demonstrate what needs to happen and then you would, try to learn something that matches what you did during the demonstrations. Now, mm -hmm. when it's hard to demonstrate, that could be an issue. Or it could be that it's not too hard to demonstrate, but it's hard to demonstrate at the scale that you need to learn from. And that's where reinforced learning can do autonomous data collection. And so it might be able to collect a much larger amount of data than you can get from demonstrations. It could also be that you can't demonstrate in the format that you need. So Maybe you want a robot to do something that maybe load your dishwasher, but it's very hard to make the robot do it. You can do it, yes, by hand yourself, but that's not the exact form factor that's easiest to learn from. It would be the third person imitation again, which is still right. a hard problem, even though some progress has been made. So the, the first shot typically, I would argue, is you try and find a way to get imitation in place. 
see how far you can get with that and then take it from there. And then typically you'll, you'll build reinforcement learning on top of that that will fine tune or in some cases imitation will just not be workable because you can't get the, the demonstrations that, that you need. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine even if you can kind of demonstrate the activity in a perfect environment, reinforcement learning has still advantages in being somewhat more robust to the position of the object that you're picking relative to just a pure imitation learning. Is that true in general? That capability of adaptation once deployed, if you let your reinforcement learner continue to learn once it's deployed, is very different from what you would get from a standard imitation learning setup. And mm-hmm. so, yes, that's absolutely a big part. That also reminds me of that. I think automation provides big opportunities. And one I'm personally particularly interested in is, is how to get reinforcement learning and imitation learning to start playing big roles in how automation works for manufacturing to make that a lot more flexible than the way things tend to be right now, which is a lot more rigid in how you need to set things up. And, and the idea being there that as opposed to a particular, you know, a, an, an an agent like a robot manipulating something we're talking about now, sequences of steps. Are we talking about kind of the big picture manufacturing or are we talking about, you know, still individual devices? It could be both. So at the individual level, it could be that instead of, you know, setting up a robot for taking multiple days or weeks to set up a robot for an individual manipulation skill, you just demonstrate a few times, you learn from that, reinforcement learns on top of that, and based on that, maybe can be deployed within hours rather than uh, days or weeks. And the bigger picture, I think, is very fascinating. Uh, it's, I mean, big. it wouldn't be that easy to execute on a small scale, but a bigger scale, if you say, I want a factory that can take in any raw materials and up with any goods, and the system can just adapt itself to whatever the needs are. You just send your design files and outcomes, you know, in goes raw materials, outcomes, the product. Um, mm. I think, I mean, that, I'm not saying that that's going to happen tomorrow, but that kind of flexibility would uh, be really amazing. And, and it seems it requires a lot of flexibility, a lot of adaptation. The, the robots in such a system need to be able to do a wide range of things. You can't just set them up for one thing because then right. something new needs to be manufactured and they need to reconfigure themselves Pick, take up a new skill and and work together to get the product made. Right, right. Well, that's a super compelling vision and maybe a great place to leave off here. Anything else that you'd like to leave the audience with? Uh, we'll definitely share that link to the Deep Learning Bootcamp, but anything else you'd like to share? Um, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for having me, Sam. This was a great and fun chat. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much, Peter. I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued support, comments, and feedback. We're excited to hear what you guys think about this show and the series. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Bonsai, once again. Be sure to check out what they're doing at bonds.ai, B-O-N-S dot A-I. Another reminder, there are less than two weeks left until the O'Reilly AI Conference in New York City. And I just saw an email this morning that prices go up today. If you'd like to attend, you can save 20% on registration using our discount code, which is PCTWIML, P-C-T-W-I-M-L. We'll link to the registration page in the show notes. I'd love to meet up with listeners at the conference. And as I mentioned last time, I'm planning a meetup during the event. I'll share details as soon as they've been ironed out. The notes for this episode can be found at twimlai.com slash talk slash 28. For more information on industrial AI, my report, or the industrial AI podcast series, visit twimlai.com slash industrial AI. As always, remember to post your favorite quote or takeaway from this episode or any other, and we'll send you a laptop sticker. You can post them as comments to the show notes page via Twitter at twimlai or via our Facebook page. Once again, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.